Our session, Bringing Down the Gender Walls, is about to commence. It is being moderated by Mr. Temur Suri, uh, sorry, Dr. Temur Rahman, who teaches political science at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He obtained his master's from Sussex University and his As long as your battery works. <laughs> Dr. Temur Rahman teaches political science at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He obtained his master's from Sussex University and his doctorate from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. He has been involved in grassroots uh, grassroots labor and Marxist politics in Pakistan for the last 15 years and in, is also the spokesperson for the popular band LAL. Mr. Temur Rehman. Thank you, Ji. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for making it out. Um, and uh, to see such a lovely crowd and to see so many people over here, that indeed is wonderful. We have a very heavy panel today heavy in the sense of these are all very sort of, uh, not in terms of their weight, but certainly in terms of their intellectual weight. Um, um, we have two panelists here from India, and uh, we have um, uh, two who are associated, uh, let's say, with Pakistan. Um, so let me briefly introduce the panelists. First, to my right is Mandira Sen, who is a publisher. She, uh, from Calcutta, she mostly publishes on um, women's issues, etc., began her publishing career by publishing for children and then diversified from there. And uh, I've just been gifted a book by her right now, so I'm very pleased. <laughs> so welcome, Ji. And um, next um, is um, uh, Dr. Uh, Anika, ya uh, sorry, Amina Yakin, who teaches at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and is currently writing a very interesting book called uh, 20th Century Women's Poetry from Pakistan, Feminist Resistance and Gendered Subjectivities. Uh, she mostly writes on post-colonial um, gender issues, etc. And uh, she's co-authored uh, recently a book which, is very, which has been very, very popular um, on 9-11, uh, uh, Framing Muslims, uh, Stereotyping and Representation After 9-11. Then we have uh, Dr. Zoya Hassan, who is from um, uh, an eminent uh, professor from, and scholar from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, which is really the sort of red bastion of uh, Indian academics as I saw it. <laughs> and um, the wonderful thing about her is that uh, she's uh, all, not only been working on gender, but also with respect to minorities, and indeed has also served on uh, a national commission uh, uh, for um, minorities and uh, uh, and, and examining uh, uh, minorities in the context of um, India. She is the author of 18 books and um, also one of a very sort of, uh, I, one, one of the books that I really sort of admired was the one you did on political parties, which is really very nice. And last but certainly not least, your very own Asad Said, Dr. Asad Said, economist, um, he focuses on political economy, mostly on globalization, but also on urban working women in the manufacturing sector. He is the director of the um, Collective for Social Research, Social Science Research here at Karachi, but he's also been associated with Piler, with SPDC, with AERC, with Ideas, and many other um, uh, research and academic ventures. So, Mandiraji, I think we'll start with you. And um, I mean, I'm sure there are many other heavy academics in the audience, but for me personally, I, um, I'm not too familiar with progressive publishing or certainly progressive writing or rather gendered writing, people who are writing on gender or women writers in India. So it would be really nice if you could give us a, perhaps a brief overview of the kind of literature that, is being, that has been produced in India, maybe its genres, its categories and so on, uh, sort of like a broad literature review of what's going on with respect to women in India. Well, I thought I'd begin, but first of all, may I say how happy I am to be here and how grateful to be invited. It's an honor for me to find out what's happening in this great city. You look behind this surface, 
and it's not very different from my hometown, Calcutta, which is also chaotic and vibrant. Um, so I actually started off thinking I would tell you about women who've been writing early rather than the secondary sources, though we can't touch upon them. And uh, there are two dates which I think are important. Uh, uh, one is uh, 1849 when a, a school was founded in Calcutta, which still exists. It's called the Bethune School. And, and it was founded by the English John Drinkwater Bethune, whom I believe in England is pronounced as Beaton, but we Bengalis have got around that. And he was the law member of the Viceroy's uh, Council. And together with a bunch of uh, enlightened Hindus and Brahmo Samajists, they founded the school. This is a key thing of starting formal education for women. Before that, you did have Vaishnavis who were educated women from a very early significant revolution in Bengal, part of this devotional movement called the Bhakti movement, where women were educated because they approached the Lord directly and not, not through these intermediaries of Brahmins and whatever. And they would often go into the Hindu Zananas and teach people. But now you had a proper school. And from that time onwards, there was a feeling that education is going to solve some of the horrors of Hindu society. It hasn't been that easy, but it was a step. And one of the first writers we get is a remarkable woman called uh, Rasha Shundari Devi, who was married at 12. She was not from a Brahmin family, but she was from the upper castes, who in Bengal still exist and have formed a group called the Bhadra Lok, the genteel educated people. And this was a direct response to British rule in India, which was uh, coming and changing things. And these Bengali upper castes, or people who wanted to join them, took on Western education, for the men of course, and they formed this group, which was a kind of intermediary group, which is still powerful today, though on its way out, we think. One of the changes that Taimur is hoping for. And uh, this lady, uh, she was married at 12 into a Zamindari family. She desperately wanted to read the Vaishnav scriptures herself, so she learned how to uh, read from her son, and she published her memoirs, 15 or 16 sections in 1876, and another 16 in 1897. This is the first autobiography we get from a Bengali, and it's a female. Mm. And she's not just writing about what she's doing. She's giving you, of course, her daily routine, which is sheer drudgery. She's a Zavindar's wife, and from morning to night, she's toiling and housework. This is partly because of the Hindu mania for pollution and purity, so she has to constantly be washing and cleaning and doing this, that, the other, because they can't have someone else do it, often going without meals. And uh, she, wrote, uh, think she wrote something very strident, which if I have a minute, I'll read out. Just because I am a woman doesn't necessarily mean that trying to educate myself is a crime. And she wrote that in 1876. Now, she, uh, so she, when she's writing her account, you, you, get, uh, you get what concerns women, you get a cogent critique of Bengali society and a great indictment of the men and what they have, the position they put women in. It's not just the plight of women, she's putting it in a patriarchal framework. So she's impressive. From then on, uh, actually, as a parallel, I'm not going to talk about Bombay presidency, but just two women there. Mukta Bai, and this is remarkable because she was an untouchable woman. She came under the influence of a great well, we say he's the first Mahatma, Mahatma Jyotiba Phule, who was from a lower caste, but he had education, and he encouraged women. He was a great pro-woman character. He had an ashram for Brahmin widows, for instance, to save them from the Brahmin men. And uh, Mukta Bai wrote a searing critic of the caste system. And she said things like, Oh, learned pundits, wind up your selfish prattle and your hollow wisdom and listen to what I have to say. This is 1855. And then there was Tarabai Shinde from that uh, part of the world who also did a Sri Purush Tulana, which is a comparison of men and women's status. So these, these, these things were happening with the impact of British rule. <coughs> in, in Bengal, with that school founding, which went on to, a, which became a college in 1872. Uh, and uh, in 1892, you get the redoubtable Sharala Bala, Sharala Devi Chaudhurani, who's a graduate. She goes up and gets a job in Mysore. Unheard of things like this. Of course, she had, she had the advantage of being a Tigor. 
But anyway, there are a whole bunch then of educated women who are writing in Bengali periodicals because this time also coincides with the new print culture. And we just did a book which, which uh, ranges from uh, 1865 to 1947. And then all these women writing on issues, on education for women, of course, then freedom for women, then what Hindu widows are to do, uh, then politics. So it's exciting. And I must tell you that the first piece is by a Bengali Muslim woman called Teheru Necha Bibi. And uh, she wrote on why women should be educated. And this was 1865. So you, you do get a lot of Hindu women writing, some Muslim women. And then when the political thing hots up, you get more writing. But I thought I would bring another date to your attention, which is 1905, the first partition of Bengal, because this is very important for Muslims, and especially for Bengali Muslim women, because that partition gave the eastern part a majority Muslim um, electorate. And suddenly, nice things started happening to the neglected community. They got more grants in, uh, in aid for education. More women stayed in schools. The gap was narrowing with Hindus. And at this time, in 1918, you get uh, uh, a Muslim editor called Muhammad Nasiruddin, who starts a magazine called Saugat, where he seeks out Bengali Muslim writers, and they write for him. Before that, there was a Hindu editor, though we, you know, we don't like to label people as Muslim and Hindus, but he happened to be one, called Ramananda Chatterjee, who had an English journal bring, coming out from Allahabad in 1901 called Modern Review, and he had a Bengali one called Prabashi. And Muslim women wrote for him too. Now both Muhammad Nasiruddin and this Ramananda Chatterjee had stereotypical ideas on Muslim women and Hindu women in the sense that women are women and they have their roles and we want them to flower, but they have their roles. But whatever it is, Muslim women and Hindu women were writing. Then Saugat goes through various trajectories and it shuts because it's uh, not viable financially. It revives in 1926. But then the politics have changed between the two communities. There's less cooperation. There's more polarization. When they move to old East Pakistan, there's something called Mahila Saugat. He's slaughtered the women too. And Saugat is left for men. And then worse, they become ladies in something called when they're writing for Begum. But the other journals I'd like to tell you briefly about is uh, by political women who are part of the national movement. There's Jayasri started in 1931, and she's remarkable, Leela Nag. Like, like our friend Amina Saeed, she probably could have run the country. And uh, she, um, she, however, got entangled with Subhash Chandra Bose, and she lost her initiative. But she, the journal still goes on. There's another one called Mandira. There's one called uh, Ghari Bairi, which is the communist journal of the Communist Party. A lot of the women, when they were in jail, became communists. They'd been arrested as Congress Party people, but they became com communists. And they founded this journal. They ran it. They wrote for it. But as it became bigger and bigger, the <coughs> Communist Party moved in and removed the women from the editorial slots and put men in. And then it became a party journal. So these journals are, are very, very important for women. And uh, I think, in a way, it created a kind of climate of women's writing. Yes, it was, in a way, elitist. It didn't go down. But then education had remained elitist. After independence, we have a whole efflorescence, as you've had here. And uh, the women's movement uh, in Bengal uh, followed the trajectories of the women's movement elsewhere in India. And a lot of the writing has been scholarly. Uh, a lot of the writing we have published, because we are an alternative uh, publisher, has not come from uh, academia. And that's quite exciting, because they've dealt with themes like the non-Brahmin movement of the South, which was another social revolution, where the uh, Ramaswamy Naikar's party actually uh, brought in women, and uh, they had a journal, they were iconoclasts, they changed all the rituals of the Brahmins, and those women are documented. So that way, you might say that gender issues have been up front in society. What did not come up front was the Dalit woman. 
And she had to go through a, a real process of articulation saying that these other women didn't speak for her, mm -hmm. that she was subject to other, uh, an additional oppression. Aside from being Dalit, there was these uh, upper caste women to contend with, and upper caste women accepted the caste system because it gave them status. And there was a third oppression they dealt with, which was Dalit men. And facing this oppression, I think, made them articulate. They've written a vast deal. I mean, the first flowering of Dalit literature is known as the, you know, the Dalit literary movement, the Dalit Panther writings of the 1970s of Bombay. But there were almost no women in it. And when we translated a book from Marathi by Urmila Pawar, who is part of this Ambedkarite movement, uh, she, uh, in fact, is very scathing of what Dalit men have done to Dalit women. And she got a lot of flack from Dalit men for saying so, one of whom we've published and who said about her, she's brought this all out in public. I mean, she's talking about domestic violence, how dreadful it is. Not that, it, uh, that, not that its occurrence is dreadful, but that she's talking about it. And she actually wrote a piece with the Minakshi Moon on the role of Dalit women in the Ambedkar right movement. So I think these things are exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have a round of applause. I mean, that's such an expansive sort of uh, talk about your look at communists, but you can ask questions. About we'll come, them later. come back to that. We can come back to that. So, Dr. Yakin, I wanted to ask you. You've been writing on the diaspora and especially on the post 9-11 world. And there was a very interesting article on the net that I happened to come across which you wrote on the Islamic Barbie. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to understand what is the Islamic Barbie doll and why is it so problematic? And you know, perhaps how does that relate to an observation that I had when I was at SOAS, that London mein Pakistani are in London, yeah, Muslim and uh, Muslim countries, uh, they often happen to be much more conservative than Muslims in, in their home country. So I don't know if the two are related in any way, and perhaps you could shed some light on that. Okay. Um, thank you, Asad. That's a fairly large question, so I'll try and answer both as much as I can. And. Um, the, the doll has a very interesting story as to how I started my project on it. Just as, out of interest, can I ask people in the audience um, how many people have, have played with a doll or they have a, children who, a child who plays with a doll? Okay, so, so it, it's um, something that marks a lot of people's lives. I um, first saw this doll um, called Razan in, the, in London. I came across her and she was uh, marketed as a Muslim doll, as an Islamic Barbie. And I was fascinated and I wanted to find out more about her. She was, um, and I discovered that she'd been created and marketed by a Muslim couple in the US and the husband is a Palestinian um, migrant and the wife is a Muslim <coughs> convert. She used to be a concert pianist in New York and uh, they were living in Michigan and at the time that they started to make this doll they developed this idea for it and then they set her up. So she's, to imagine her you have to uh, think about visibly Muslim accessories such as a hijab, a jilbab, a prayer rug. These are the accessories that um, Razan comes with and she is um, what I would call a a modest doll, a doll that is very much unlike the Barbie doll that a lot of us are familiar with or have, might desire to have as a doll. And she does bear a very strong resemblance to Mattel's Barbie and I was fascinated that she had this kind of blonde hair as well. So here was this Muslim doll with blonde hair, not to say that Muslims can't have blonde hair and blue eyes, but uh, here she was. and. Um, she was, and I, I was, um, and just anecdotally, I was in Lahore and I'd been to um, Al Huda conference of, or a session, and I was chatting to one of the stall holders outside, and I um, 
said to him, so I'm looking for this doll, do you happen to have it? And I thought he's going to say, what on earth are you talking about? He said, yes, yes, I I'm, I'm really uh, want to have that doll, I've ordered it for my daughter. So it's, it's just to give you a sense that it wasn't just in living in a pocket in the diaspora, it, it does have um, significance across. And, um, and she helped me cross some borders as well in Europe when I was going to Germany and I was being questioned because I was going to a Muslim conference about what my, what my talk was going to be about. So I, I just sort of showed them the doll and then they were quite happy. So the person who's talking about doll, dolls can't possibly be doing something um, related to terror. <clears throat> So, anyway, going back to the company that makes the doll, they're called Noor Art, and they are a website, and they are a, well, they're not exactly an evangelical group, but they're um, quite, um, they have quite an ideological mission of importing a certain Islamic value to their customers and their um, uh, followers. And their marketing strategy around Razan relies really on the toned down mimicry of the recognizably branded products such as Barbie. And she, for them, the Razan doll really, you know, has to retain her cultural values in the West. So she has these dresses that she can wear, which are these American dresses. And if you were living in the 1950s in the US, they're those kinds of dresses that come up to your knees and they're fairly not immodest, but you know, sleeveless and all, but she's allowed to wear them, but she's allowed to wear them at home. The message is very clear. So when she's outside, she's got to perform her Muslim identity. So when she steps outside the house, she has to wear her jilbab, her blue coat and her, and her hijab. And then I, I, you know, as you do, well, having two small girls myself, the first thing children do is they take off the, do the clothes of the doll, right? And uh, that's uh, hugely problematic for, um, a lot of parents when you've got Barbie with fairly uh, voluptuous uh, breasts and you know she's got the whole kind of body uh, of a desirable young woman so what they've done is they've uh, with the Razan they've flattened the upper body of, of the doll so she's not so sexual if you might say and they've also they're not exactly painted on but they've also got these white um, um, underpants that they've put on her. So like with Barbie, you can, you know, everything can come off, but with her, with Razan, you can't take those things off. And, and it's quite, they're quite, um, you know, they're not sexy in any way, those white material sort of trousers. So it's, I think the, and, and on the box, on the toy, toy box that comes with it, it it's very clearly says, you know, that this is here to, um, to give you a message. So it really, captures this niche market of both an ethnic minority and Muslim buyers. And post 9-11, you know, there's a lot of reaction, obviously, to American products and American branding. So there's, it's also what I see a counter hegemonic move by groups such as Nurat to develop in developing this brand. It's not at the same, you know, it doesn't, it's quite tricky to see it in the same way as you might see a a brand like the Halal brand, which is, um, you know, takes part in the whole material culture of capitalism in, in a strong way. But um, I think the doll and Nurat are slightly in the middle of that zone. Now, you'll, you'll be interested to know that this is not the only doll. There are also other ones in the Middle East and Europe. You've got a variety. You've got the national Iranian duo. They're called Dara and Sara. They're twin dolls, brother and sister. And they were really um, introduced in 2002 in Iran to curtail the popularity of Barbie and Ken. And um, dare I say that the uh, Iranian um, government said that the Barbie was a Jewish toy. So, you know, we had to think of other things. Um, developed and marketed by the Institute of, for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults in consultation with the Ministry of Education, the Dara and Sara dolls are supposed to be eight-year-old siblings. They wear modest clothes. They represent traditional values. Sara has a white scarf covering her hair. And um, there's a really interesting quote by an Iranian toy seller that I want to share with you. And he says that... 
The dolls are an important addition to the market because they are representative of Iranian values and a much needed intervention against the wanton Barbie, who she believes to be more harmful than an American missile. <clears throat> then we've got the Syrian doll, Fulla. Fulla is a bit more sleek as, uh, uh, you know, she wears designer clothes, she has Carolina Herrera, she has sort of all the different stuff. Uh, and um, she is really quite similar to Barbie and has a very expansive wardrobe. And the differences between the lifestyle, clothing and hair color as usual. And, you know, she's got the abaya and uh, etc. Anyway, when I was, when I was sort of looking more into Razan, I contacted the, the makers of Razan and I asked them as well, you know, whether they would have a male toy doll like um, Barbie has Ken. And they said um, that there was no, um, no kind of plans for that. And um, what this Razan doll did, it really took the British media by storm. So a lot of the newspapers, the ta tabloids and the broadsheets were covering it. Because, um, and the, the cov Muslim representation becomes quite a popular, well, it has been historically quite popular, but post 9-11, you know, Muslim items in the news are quite sellable. You know, they make the news worth reading, as it were, because it's some something quite extreme, something quite different. It's not part of what is our culture in uh, what is considered to be culturally British. Um, it's seen still to be slightly outside at a tangent with British society. So what you get is the tabloids will put Burqa Barbie on with the, I don't know if anyone here has read The Sun, which is a tabloid paper in, the, in, in England, and they have this uh, tradition of a page three model who is topless. And next to her, you know, there's a picture of uh, Burqa Barbie. And I think it's quite fascinating when you put those two together and try and think of what kind of cultural iconography is being represented to us as readers and consumers of this kind of popular discourse. You know, how do we understand it? So it's um, really uh, those kinds of questions that I was thinking about. And um, we, um, there's a really um, important story, I think, that I should also fill you in, a, a story about uh, Muslim women's dress, which has been a topic of public controversy in England since 2002, when we had this girl called Shabina Begum, who was a 13-year-old British Muslim girl suspended from school for continuing to wear a jilbab and ignoring the school uniform code. <clears throat> Shabina Begum then stopped going to school and, indicate, uh, and initiated legal proceedings against um, the school, and she was supported by her guardian and brother, and who was advised by the Islamist group Hizb tahrir Now, um, according to Emma Talo, who is... Um, has done a lot of work on this. The political activism around the hijab jilbab debate deployed by this radical group has basically allowed for this a sartorial means of rejecting and resisting the West from within the West. And I mean, certainly Hizbut Tahrir are an example of Islamist, Islamist activism and their operating in Britain since 1996. And they're, you know, I'm not saying that they're in any way connected to the production of these consumable dolls. But what the connection I want to make is what the desire they share in common with the creators of these transnational subjects is this desire to fix a visual stereotype mm. for Muslim women. And uh, really that was, um, you know, the, the kind of reason for looking at it. And also I was, very interested to look at the internet because the internet, you know, as uh, people like Miriam Cook and Bruce Lawrence have talked about it, it's a paradox, it's a really paradoxical space and you've got the functioning of networks which cut across class boundaries, gender boundaries, they deterritorialize and they're also gender inclusive but at the same time you also have a reaffirmation of certain kinds of stereotyping that goes on. So that's the kind of story Yeah, I there. think that's uh, fascinating. Let's have a round of applause.
Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions at the end, but um, we really should leave some time for questions. So we'll move to Professor Hassan, um, who, as I said, has written 18 books and is focused on minorities and also gender issues. So when we talk about both these things, you know, I'd re I think the audience here and myself in particular, we'd really be interested in knowing more about Muslim women in India. You hear about Muslims in India as a whole, either in the sense that from the Pakistani right wing that, oh, they're so terribly oppressed or whatnot, and uh, you hear a triumphalist sort of note come from India, you know, everything's fine and so on. But what is the reality, especially not just of Muslims, but of Muslim women in, Indi in India, if you could shed some light on that. Uh, first of all, I think I'd like to express my gratitude to the Oxford University Press for inviting me to this uh, lovely uh, festival and I'm delighted to be here. Now you've asked me broadly two questions, one with regard to Muslims, how they're fared and, and so on, and the other more particularly with regard to Muslim women. Mm. Uh, let me try and briefly, in the interest of time, respond to both of them uh, very quickly. Uh, you had sent me an email uh, with some of these questions and, I've, and one of the, the very first line in your email was that uh, there's a general sense that Muslims are oppressed in India. Uh, and I, my response to that was that I think that's clearly not true. Muslims are not oppressed, but that is not to say that they're not disadvantaged and deprived. They're indeed disadvantaged and deprived and, and this has become very evident in the last a few, year, few years. Your second point was a second issue which you've broadly raised, uh, raised now as well is with regard to the status of Muslims in secularism and whether secularism in India is really serious and whether it has, uh, has benefited Muslims or not. Now, I think uh, secularism is certainly one of the pillars of Indian nationhood. There's no doubt about it. And really, uh, I mean, India attempted, and I think attempted with some success, to establish a secular state. And that secular state came to be established when, of course, when Jawaharlal Nehru was the prime minister. It has suffered some setbacks over the past uh, two decades or so. But I think it is really, there is no alternative to secularism in India because India is, as we know, one of the world's most plural, multicultural, diverse uh, societies. But that said, and really this is the principal point that I want to make, uh, make and that is uh, that I think it, with regard to Muslims, I think what has happened is that secularism uh, has been reduced to an ideology that provides formal rights, uh, equality to Muslims, but not substantive rights. And I think that, that has much to do with, uh, with the kind of attitude and policies that the <coughs> Indian state has followed, that political parties have followed, and above all, I think the Muslim community as, as well. All three have looked upon Muslims from the prism of identity politics, which has uh, highlighted the cultural rights of minorities, uh, the freedom of religion, the right to establish educational institutions of their choice, but has, has, been very, uh, has, has made a distinction between these rights and social and economic rights, or what I would call substantive rights. Substantive rights from the very beginning were given to disadvantaged castes. So I think it's important to understand that the whole approach to Muslims in India was to some extent shaped by, uh, in the backdrop of partition. I think the whole policy discourse, the whole conceptual approach to, uh, to minorities in general and Muslims in, in particular was overdetermined by partition. However, I think it has become evident in the past uh, couple of decades that this approach, uh, while providing e equal rights in theory, in practice, I think Muslims have lagged behind. They have, been, uh, they have not really been able to benefit from, I would say, fairly substantial economic and social development that has taken place in India. And they've also not benefited very significantly from the economic <coughs> boom in India after the introduction of economic liberalization in 1991. And I think this, uh, in other words, Muslims have suffered more than perhaps any other group from a development deficit. 
And this was rather convincingly demonstrated and highlighted, and it was significant, by a committee that was appointed by the government, that is to say the United Progressive Alliance government, uh, the Prime Minister's high-level committee on the socio-economic status of Muslims. The very appointment of this committee, I think, was a very significant conceptual shift, because for the first time, any government in independent India was, had uh, was bold enough, and I underline this, to actually appoint a committee on the socio-economic status of Muslims and not, let us say, minorities as a whole, uh, and there are five, uh, five now, six official, officially recognized religious minorities in, in India, or what is usually done in India is to, uh, is to look at disadvantaged groups more generally or what were historically and usually referred to as the weaker sections, but thankfully we don't use that kind of uh, that, that kind of discourse anymore, the term that is now used is either disadvantaged or deprived. Now this committee of course highlighted the, uh, the development deficit and I think this has, led to a, uh, this has led to a significant change and I think the change is that for the first time Muslims are being looked upon as subjects of development and not just as identity carriers. Uh, uh, and whose identity, Muslim identity or minority identity, uh, needed to be uh, needed to be uh, protected. And for the first time, I think, uh, for the first time, Muslims themselves are also shifting from the politics of identity that had so consumed them for the past 60 years to a politics of development. So now this change. I think is, is quite exceptional, but of course, before I overstate it, I should also point out that this is more in the nature of a policy shift, a conceptual shift. Much remains, uh, much remains uh, to be done, much remains to be done to really uh, overcome the uh, development deficit that Muslims have been uh, suffering from. And I think w one of the reasons why this, uh, why it has been difficult to implement uh, this policy, policy shift of the past five or six years is that, um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with Indian politics and, how, and India's democratic politics and how competitive it is, and also obviously uh, the huge political sniping that has been going on between the ruling Congress uh, party and the United Progressive Alliance and the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which is the principal, uh, principal opposition party. And I think the Muslim question in India, unfortunately, even when there is uh, even when it is moving forward, as it clearly is, I think, and I, let's make no mistake, that there is clearly and unmistakably a change in the terms of debate with regard to Muslims in India, and a change of debate, a change of debate for the better. But as I said, it is still, it still gets uh, caught up in this political conflict between between the Congress and uh, between the Congress and uh, the BJP. Now, your second question and a very important one with regard to Muslim women. Let me again say uh, very uh, briefly that I think when it comes to Muslim women, the entire debate, the post-independence debate uh, in India, and I would say until recently, the entire debate on Muslim women in India has really been dominated by the question of personal law those who are for the preservation of personal law or those who are opposed to it and would like it to be changed or to be completely rejected, they have really dominated the debate. So Muslim women, again, are not really the subjects of their, uh, their destiny, so to speak, or the agents of their destiny, but they are, <coughs> but they are obviously the agents of, of the identity of the Muslim community, either those who, want, who use them for the preservation of Muslim identity, defined principally, in terms of uh, personal laws, or those like uh, the Hindu right, which is complete, completely opposed to personal laws, uh, and would like it to be uh, would like it to be uh, changed. Now, I think so. In a way, bo uh, both uh, those who are for and against uh, personal law have really dominated uh, dominated it. And, and once again, I think the Congress and the BJP have locked horns on this question, which is an important one because I would like to say that uh, while there is an excessive preoccupation uh, and a near obsession with uh, personal law, with Muslim personal law, uh, uh, but at the same time, I think there is a problem, and the problem is that Muslim personal law has not been reformed at all. It has not been changed, and, uh, and clearly uh, the greatest sufferers of that have been Muslim women. Now, I think, again, the debate on this is changing, uh, e uh, and changing 
uh, to some extent with the entry of the women's movement uh, in India into this debate about 20 years ago. And I think the, Muslim, uh, the entry of the women's movement came at a moment of uh, when communal politics in India was intensifying in the 1990s and the BJP was on the rise and, B and, and the BJP and the Hindu right were coming to the political center stage and of course eventually formed the government for the first time uh, in, in, uh, in independent India in 1998. But I think at that moment the, there was an interesting turn in the position of the, uh, of the women's movement which until the rise of the Hindu right was very, was very committed to a reform of personal law and had actually favored a, uni uh, a uniform civil code. But with the uh, intensification of communal politics and particularly Hindu communal politics and the sense that the Muslim minority was vulnerable in this context, I think there was a change of tack on the part of the women's movement which shifted its long-standing support for a uniform civil code to a position which is problematic, but nonetheless, uh, it has brought about some change, and that is uh, reform from within. That is to say, personal law needs to be changed, but it should be changed from within by Muslims and by Muslim women in particular. But there's another thing that I think the Muslim, uh, the, sorry, that the women's movement did, which was that alongside changing the debate from the Uniform Civil Code to uh, uh, reform from within, it also highlighted the, uh, the need to focus on the socio-economic status of <coughs> Muslim women. And I think, and this is the second point, and let me uh, just end, uh, end with this point. And I think, that, and that is that uh, uh, it's very clear uh, in response to your question that Muslim women in India face considerable challenges. Uh, they face considerable uh, challenges, uh, challenges which, which I think have to do uh, with being, of course, citizens of a democratic country uh, and also uh, being members of a vulnerable, disadvantaged uh, minority. And I think they face disadvantages in three areas in particular, I would say. Uh, education, employment, and access to social welfare programs. And I think you're aware, and most of you would be aware, that India has introduced, and that is to, to the credit of the Indian state, it has in, introduced a whole slew of social welfare programs over the last 50, 60 years, and particularly, I think, in the last 10 years, there's been a very major, uh, major shift with a focus on rights-based uh, rights uh, welfare programs, mandatory rights-based welfare programs. Now, I think Muslim women face uh, and, and many surveys and, uh, and studies have shown that they, uh, <coughs> that they face problems in accessing them because I think it is important to remember that one of the reasons why Muslims are disadvantaged, unlike other disadvantaged groups such as the lower castes in India, is that there are no affirmative action programs for minorities. And again, as you are aware, India was a pioneer when it comes to affirmative action program. And this, it was a pioneer, particularly in the post-war period, which is to say that perhaps no other country in the world in the late 1940s and early 1950s embarked on such an ambitious uh, affirmative action program known as reservations in India. However, uh, these programs were principally for uh, the, uh, for lower caste, Hindu, Hindu caste groups, i.e. the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. They excluded Muslims from their purview, and this of course has much to do with the whole separatist movement and Pakistan and the understanding of the, of the Constituent Assembly and India's constitution makers that it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a uh, separate electorates and reservations for Muslims that the British has introduced which is responsible for partition and therefore there was no question of continuing that and, and consequently Muslims uh, were excluded from the purview of affirmative action programs. And this has been one of the major, uh, major is issues of debate because Muslims now are demanding and many are supporting them that you cannot now 65 years or s almost 66 years after independence or partition persist with the kind of understanding that guided India's democratic project and India's affirmative action project and social welfare project and you have to now include uh, minorities and particularly Muslims, and especially as the Sachar Committee ha report has shown that they are so uh, that they are so disadvantaged. 
So I think the status of Muslim women then uh, is, uh, is something of concern, uh, is, is something of concern. And I think it indicates the shortage of really three essentials, uh, which is knowledge, uh, economic power, and autonomy. Now, in all of this, the Indian state to some extent is responsible, but I would say the Muslim community and the very conservative, and I would say retrograde, leadership of the Muslim community in India is also responsible right. for the denial of these three essentials to, uh, to Muslim women, and in that sense, uh, in a certain sense, uh, weakening uh, their claims over citizenship. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive indeed. Um, you have lecture in 10 minutes, and you have course in 10 minutes. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. I just said, pura course jo hai on Muslim women in India, wo aapne 10-15 minute ke jo sum up kar diya. It was very wonderful. Thank you so much. We can come back to it. Asad sahab, aap jo hai har vakat structural adjustment policies pe tanqeed karte rehte hain aur alam giriyat globalization pe tanqeed karte rehte hain. Magar mere jaisa nadi jo hai, mein to ye dekhta hoon ki McDonald's jab mein jata hoon, wahan bhi bibiyaan kaam kar rahi hain. TV jab mein on karta hoon, asi channel hain. Wahan pe bhoot sari bibiyaan jo hai, wo naach kaana kar rahi hain. Or corporate executives, maybe my dekh toh. There's many women sort of participating in that. Then we've got social media, Facebook, uh, uh, cell phone technology. So hasn't globalization li liberated women here in, in the context of Pakistan? What's your take on that? Um, I think it has at uh, at one level. I, uh, in the last ten years or so, we've seen a, uh, a perceptible change. Uh, there are more women in the public sphere uh, than there were uh, perhaps earlier um, at the middle strata. Uh, so in beauty parlors, at McDonald's restaurants, on televisions, in news uh, agencies, etc. Um, so there is change and that's, that's good and we should all uh, acknowledge it and it's appreciated. Uh, but also understand that that is one stratum of, of society. Um, the most, um, I, and I'm going to be talking about women and remunerative work, um, the most um, sort of uh, poignant uh, visual symbol, f at least for myself, whenever I travel outside of Pakistan, and this is virtually anywhere in the world, including sub-Saharan Africa, is uh, how few women you see in Pakistan in the public sphere. In, in, in the, the general public space, uh, just out and about, uh, on the streets, in, in uh, driving vehicles, or, or just uh, women out there. Um, and that is uh, actually corroborated by statistics. Um, South Asia, in general, has a very low, uh, what we call, labor force participation rate of women. Um, and that is women who are willing to work um, and of the age to work and willing to work, both employed and unemployed. Um, so South Asia uh, lags behind the rest of the world and virtually any other region in the world. And Pakistan is at the bottom of the table so far as South Asia is concerned. Even Bhutan and Nepal and Bangladesh has a very good labor force participation rate, so does uh, uh, Sri Lanka. And apart from other uh, issues that one would come to later, uh, is that fertility rates in Pakistan have not declined um, to the same extent as, as they have elsewhere. Now that is one very important determinant of women working its, uh, uh, and participating in the labor force. Um, so, so, so that, that, that has happened. Now, um, so far as a critique of neoliberalism or globalization over the last 20 years, I think what it has done is that it has, uh, uh, let, let me put it another way, that, that the women's participation in the labor market anywhere in the world has happened really over the last hundred years or even less. And it has happened through two instruments. One is uh, 
uh, uh, countries have pushed for it. Fertility rates have, have uh, declined. Social policy has enabled it. And large public sectors everywhere in the world have been able to provide reasonably good jobs to women. This is what I'm talking about, uh, the, the way the, the transformation happened in the developed world and even some of the countries in South Asia like Sri Lanka. Um, so that avenue is no longer there. So what you have is growing informalization of work. And that informalization we see in intense price competition at the bottom rung of the work. So when one goes out to buy an imitation Gucci handbag or a slipper today, in today's world, um, and looks for the cheapest possible uh, good uh, uh, um, slipper or, or, or handbag, but with a designer label or, or, an, or a nice packaging, it is really not the niche of that product that one is buying. One is really buying cheap labor. And that cheap labor, the woman sitting in Landi or Kaidabad working from home today is actually competing with another woman sitting in Cambodia or uh, Vietnam or Laos. Um, so so that's, that's the level of competition that is uh, exploitative and has brought women into the network of remunerative work, but at a uh, at a very rough edge of it. Um, now, th having said that, um, there was a, uh, a contemporary of uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, one of the f first few renowned women economists, uh, John Robinson, and she said, uh, you know, it's actually better to be in the, in the sphere of exploitation than to be out of it. So, for having them drawn in, uh, research shows where it has been possible uh, that there are positive intergenerational uh, effects that, that do take place. Um, so it, it's very different from the story that Mandira said of uh, uh, the, the lady in the 19th century who was going through drudgery um, and her children were also were imbibing nothing else but looking at that woman doing that drudgery for, for no... Um, uh, sort of apparent gain from it. Here there are possibilities of it, there are possibilities of organizing, and that states can um, manage to do that at some stage or the other. Um, so I, I, I see the glass as half full. There are, uh, and there's, there's a huge role that social policy can play. And I think in Pakistan, there have been some very important uh, developments so far as social policy uh, is concerned. Um, so one uh, that has gone through, um, we've had for the last two decades, uh, very underrated and below the radar, is the Lady Health Workers Program. I wonder, uh, the, actually the, uh, the person who designed the program is part of this literature festival, Shanaz Wazir Ali. I don't know whether she's here, but it was a unique program which uh, provided a stipend to girls who had passed uh, uh, the middle school from that very area, provided them with basic training and um, it, it kept them with, provided them a, a job with a small stipend in that particular area. And n evaluation after evaluation shows that it has had positive health outcomes, it has had positive empowerment outcomes. Um, then we've had the Benazir Income Support Program in the last five years, where women in FATA have had to go out and get a photo taken uh, to, to be able to, to be eligible for, for, for the thousand rupee uh, cash transfer. Uh, the jury is out on that. But some of the initial evaluations also show that there is a positive empowering impact. <coughs> Excuse me. Other than that, I think it's also uh, legislation which is very important. And uh, now, I've, I do anticipate uh, questions coming that how is legislation important and we can discuss that later. But um, 
we've had some horrible legislation in Pakistan, some uh, misogynistic legislation during the Zia era, which carried on. Some of it has been removed lately. Uh, the uh, Hudud ordinance, the, the teeth from the Hudud ordinance have been taken out in 2006. And after that, we've had a spate of pro-women legislation in the last few years on domestic violence, on uh, uh, sexual harassment, on uh, acid uh, throwing, etc. So uh, there's all of that happening. But then there's the dark side also, yeah. So, so sorry to I know that there's lots of questions for you. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, so what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is open the house to your questions. And what we'll do is we'll just take a round of questions, and then you can have your concluding. You can respond to them. You can note them down or whatever. So we can pass around the mic. So we have a question here. Uh, hello. I have a question that how a Hindu um, woman is treated by Indian society who is a widow, but she belongs to a higher class system. Is she appreciated? to remarry or to perform wedding rituals and all? Good question. We have a question here. Yes, um, thank you. I'd just like to ask, there's one thing that um, is very difficult and we talk about women in public spaces and women on the roadside. We don't have women riding scooters over here and one of my personal heroes, Sabine Mahmood, actually got an electric scooter and now she's driving to and from work which created quite a lot of furor and popularity. Um, so if you could talk about what are the problems of getting women literally astride scooters and, and, and sort of going to small places, I think that would really increase mobility and mobility is the key to empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. Next. The question over here. I want yeah. to know why there are so many rape cases in India. Rape cases in India. Uh, would it make more sense for Muslim women to join the national women's movement, you know, fight for the re reforms through that, or go through uh, the community? Uh, and the second question which I wanted to ask was um, uh, about the Muslim uh, religious leaders. What sort of clout or influence do they wield on the community? To what extent, you know, like do they impact on the thing? And my third question is about Narendra Modi. How, to what, uh, what will be the plight of Muslims just in case he is voted into power? Thank you. Either be, can you repeat, yeah. please? Ek Modi ke wale se question tha. Narendra Modi ke. Yeah, the uh, second, what was the second question again? Okay, the last one was about Narendra Modi. How you see him, I suppose. Yeah. How do I see him? <laughs> yeah. See, alaikum. Uh, if bringing down the gender walls, which is the topic, means uh, mutual respect, creating mutual respect between men and women as equal, then uh, I would suggest that uh, education, which is supposed to open up the mind, uh, and allow people to get rid of the baggage that uh, most men grow up with in, in terms of indoctrination of the roles of the two sexes. Uh, this seems to be, uh, right now there's a strong movement uh, to divert resources for educating women right. more than men. Right. It seems to me that in this context, women are far more educated than men already and should there not be the bulk of the resources for education diverted towards educating men. Asad, you can answer that question. Uh, Veda actually didn't hear most of the questions, so I'd just like the moderator to repeat the questions before they answer here. Okay, let's do that. Um, <coughs> Um, I was wondering, um, you've all talked about the present state of Muslim women. I was wondering if you can comment on where the Muslim woman is going and especially around uh, Muslim women in uh, Pakistan uh, uh, around religiosity and if that's a, a way of empowerment. Right, let's just have two more comments and then we'll come back to the panel. 
my name is Nizam. I want to comment on uh, what Asad Saeed contributed. Uh, beside other things, you could have mentioned the extraordinary level of political participation by the women in the Pakistani political process during the last 20 years. And the epitome of this process is the five women marching on the roads of Pakistan for the last 60 days and they have traveled maybe more than 60 days. 83 days. 83 days and they have covered 2000 kilometers for some, some, some issue. You could have mentioned this. Wonderful. Challenge, I think uh, maybe we'll uh, now take the concluding comments. I hope that the panelists have sort of noted down the um, specific comments. So, Asad, we'll start with you. Perhaps you could address that question of uh, education resources. Yeah, there are three questions. It's, uh, the first one was actually something which uh, uh, is, is uh, potentially very exciting and, and good, and uh, uh, that's women and scooties and scooters. Um, the, I th as, uh, here, Shahbaz Sharif has started a scheme on that in, in, in Punjab. But what we do see in Karachi are uh, some initial uh, uh, sort of uh, elements of it, and there are some women who are driving uh, the, the uh, scooters, and uh, uh, mobility is a huge issue and a huge impediment to, in, especially in, la in larger cities. And the way the buses are packed and the way um, women are, uh, are basically treated uh, on, on that front. Um, it's, it's going to be an uphill, uh, an uphill task. It is a misfortune that even something as simple and innocent as this is going to be an act of bravery or an act of, um, of, of heroism to, to break this barrier. Um, we would need, I mean, th there would have to be need from, from the rest of civil society and if there is electronic media here, I hope they don't bring it down because they can bring anything down in a jiffy and are one of the most conservative forces in uh, Pakistani society today. Uh, education and women, Pakistan has a hugely bad record in terms of education of women. The gap between men's education and women's education is huge. And uh, it's uh, the level of literacy, the number of women going to school and being retained in schools is uh, the gap uh, is one of the highest and highest in South Asia. I, I, say I wouldn't be surprised if there are not, uh, there may be a few uh, African countries that do worse, but, uh, but uh, nobody else does. Uh, another important point I, I want to raise here. We have to. Uh, yeah. the next just panel is just, just yeah. one point that Pakistan is the only country in the world that I know, and it may be Saudi Arabia is the other one, where primary schooling of women, of boys and girls is separate in the public sector. Religious leaders, and then there are political leaders. But I think they, uh, the Muslim leadership as a whole does enjoy clout largely because secular political parties uh, rely on them to mobilize support uh, during elections, even though uh, Muslims do not really vote on se uh, sectarian lines in India. And, and also, I think any time uh, uh, Muslim clerics have put up candidates, they've been resoundingly defeated. Yet there is an assumption, and this is, of course, a worldwide assumption, and I think this was referred to earlier as well. There's a wor worldwide assumption that Muslims will listen to, uh, listen to clerics and that they would be influenced by, uh, by the choices that, uh, that Muslim clerics would make. And consequently, that, that assumption gives them, uh, gives them considerable, uh, considerable uh, right. influence. Uh, Narendra Modi, what can one say? He clearly poses a threat to the very idea of India, which is a pluralist idea. Uh, he poses, I think, a threat to secularism, uh, and he poses a threat also to democracy because he's a very authoritarian, uh, dictatorial person. So his, the problem with Modi is not just his, uh, uh, that he represents the Hindu right, but I think he's also a conservative leader and also it's his economics because he's very much backed by India's very powerful corporate sector and some of the most powerful corporate companies in India are backing Narendra Modi and his whole economic agenda 
is a right-wing economic agenda, even though it is presented more broadly in terms of development for uh, development Thank for all. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. I think we are running out of time, so I'll call on Dr. Yakin. Okay, so the um, question that was posed to me was, um, where are Muslim women going broadly in the Muslim world? I, it's, it's difficult to answer that one because it's, um, you know, I couldn't possibly speak on uh, on that whole topic because it's so diverse. In, in Pakistan. Pakistan. In yes. Pakistan, okay. Um, I think, uh, I mean, picking up on the point that Zoya is making about uh, the secular democracy and the religious um, uh, presence and uh, the identification for women within those bit or between those two contexts, I think, is still something that is taking place. And it can either take, you know, it is sometimes extreme, it is sometimes in the middle, it sometimes goes either way. I think the place that we should look at right now that's really interesting with regards to this is Turkey with the women's question. And I think one of the phenomena, of course, that um, is used again and again in politics around women uh, internationally as well as in Pakistan is around veiling and how veiling is politicized in so many different ways in, you know, if you think about it in France, if you think about it here, if you think about it in sort of the 1980s over right. here, etc. So, I mean, I, I would say perhaps there's um, a new way forward for women between the secular and the religious that we Thank uh, you. think about. Thank you, Dr. Yakin. And last, over, you get the last word, uh, Mandiraji. Well, the high caste Hindu woman uh, was in a very sorry state and this is because it was her crime to be alive after her husband died and Sati had been outlawed in 1832 which was the cohesive system of the upper caste Hindu male so she's dispatched to heaven with her husband and keeps the lineage uh, purity alive because they were terrified of the, what's going to happen to her unguarded womb but in 1856, more reformers, and then there's a problem of what do you do with these widows who are now alive? Anyway, there was Remarriage of Hindu Widow Act. Since 1856, it has taken 150 years to get the orthodox Hindu male to change, albeit reluctantly. So today she has freedom, but possibly there's quite a low remarriage rate. Now she dresses as everybody else. In fact, one orthodox male told me, Ab to pata nahi jara, ye vidwa hai. He was very upset about it. <laughs> anyway, but uh, the, the lower castes became, used this punishing regime on their widows to come up in status. Since, the, since today, this doesn't happen because society is changing so fast. For instance, the divorce rate in cities is very high. Right. So, you know, that immediately changes the situation of the widow. It's wonderful. not a good system, but it's changing. Wonderful. Let's have a big round of applause for our wonderful panel over here. Thank you so much. <laughs>